Now I will discuss snake bite in children. Most snake bites in children are from non-venomous species of snake. Generally 50% of all venomous snake bites are dry bites that is the venom is not injected. 20% of the pit viper snake bite is a dry bite and 80% of the coral snake bite is also a dry bite. It is important to know that venomous snake bite is relatively more severe in children than the adults because they receive similar venom load but they have less circulatory blood volume to dilute its effects. Snake venom is a mixture of proteins. It contain large enzymes which cause local tissue destruction and small polypeptides which are absorbed and cause lethal systemic effects. Some snakes contain neurotoxin which has courier like blockade at neuromuscular junction and this is responsible for the neurotoxicity. Severe tissue necrosis is produced by all snake bites in viper D family. African spitting cobra also produce tissue necrosis. Neurotoxicity is produced by Alapidae family, Southern Pacific rattlesnake, Western diamond back rattlesnake, timber rattlesnake and mojave rattlesnake. Severity and symptoms of snake bite in children vary according to the type of snake, amount of venom injected and location of the bite. Now simply fear from the snake bite result in nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, cold, clammy skin or syncope regardless of whether the venom is injected or not. Now I will discuss the specific symptoms of snake bite in children. First the viper D and venomation that is the two vipers or the snake vipers. In these snake bites any organ may be affected. Locally there is pain and swelling, ecchymosis, variable necrosis and these local effects progress over hours to days. In severe cases there may be consumptive coagulopathy that is bleeding episodes, hypotension and respiratory distress. It is important to determine the degree of envenomation. In dry bite locally there are punctures or abrasions and pain and tenderness is present at the bite site. There are no systemic sign and symptoms and lab abnormalities are not present. In mild or minimal envenomation, locally there are punctures or abrasion and pain and tenderness, edema and erythema is present at and adjacent to the bite site. There are no systemic effects or lab abnormalities. In moderate envenomation, locally there are punctures or abrasion and pain, tenderness, edema and erythema is present beyond area adjacent to the bite site. In moderate envenomation, there may be systemic effects. These include perioral paresthesia, peripheral paresthesia, gustatory changes, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, weakness, light, headedness, diaphrosis and chill. Now lab abnormalities are present in these cases. Now I will discuss the specific symptoms of LAPD snake bites. In this there is little or no local tissue damage. There is variable local pain and systemic effects are delayed for hours. Neurotoxic manifestations include cranial nerve palsy which can result in ptosis, dysarthria and dysphagia. Respiratory failure due to diaphragm paralysis can occur and there may be complete descending paralysis. Now I will discuss the important laboratory workup in snake bite. Complete blood count should be done. It may show low platelet count. Hemoglobin may be decreased. Prothrombin time and activated partial thromboplastin time may be raised. Serum fibrinogen level is decreased and fibrin degradation products are elevated in severe cases. Serum electrolytes, urea and creatinine, liver function test and blood glucose should also be done. Blood grouping, ABGs, serum creatine kinase and urine examination should be advised. Chest x-ray is done if there is dyspnea. Sometimes the snake teeth are left at the bite site and x-ray or ultrasound of the bitten area is advised. Now in case if the patient has altered mental status then neuroimaging should be done to reveal intracranial bleed. Now I will discuss the management of snake bite in children. First the pre-hospital care. In case of a suspicious or a definite snake bite, transport the child rapidly to the emergency department of a hospital. Remove the constrictive clothing, jewelry and watches at the bite site. Immobilize the injured part in a position of function at the level of heart. There is no need to capture or transport the snake to the hospital. However, if it is safe, take the photograph of the snake. Avoid tourniquet, ice, electric shock or incision and suction. 
all these proposed field treatments are ineffective and harmful. Now I will discuss the hospital management. Admit any child with a potential venomous snake bite to a closely observed setting for at least 24 hours, regardless of whether evidence of envenomation exists. Children with severe toxicity should be admitted in intensive care unit. In mild envenomation, local wound care include copious tap water or normal saline irrigation under pressure. Analgesics are given for pain control and opiates are preferred. Non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs should be avoided. Reassurance and observation is important and also update tetanus immunization. Now I will discuss the management of moderate and severe snake envenomation. First, it is important to assess and maintain airway breathing and circulation. Oxygen endotracheal intubation or ventilatory support may be required. Intravenous line should be maintained in the unaffected limb. For shock, normal saline intravenous bolus can be given and these may be repeated three times as required. For refractory shock, vasopressin infusion in the form of dopamine or epinephrine can be given. If there is suspicious of an acute anaphylactic reaction to snake venom, then it is treated with adrenaline, volume expansion with normal saline, diphenhydramine or other antihistamines, nebulized beta agonist, and corticosteroids. Remove the constrictive clothing, jewelry, watches, or tourniquet placed by the layman. Immobilize the affected part in a position of function and at the level of the heart. Mark the bitten extremity at two or more sides proximal to the bite and edema. And monitor the circumference of these sides every 15 minutes. Now it is important to identify the snake and the specific anti-snake venom should be administered. Dilute the antivenom in 20 ml per kilogram of normal saline up to 250 to 1000 ml and avoid volume overload. Start this intravenous infusion slowly and increase the rate gradually as tolerated and administer entire dose in about 1 hour. If anaphylactic reaction to this antivenom occur, then stop it, give adrenaline, antihistamine and corticosteroid, then restart the antivenom more diluted and at a slower rate. Now here are the indications for snake antivenom in case of snake bite in children. First is the evidence of systemic toxicity that is hypotension, respiratory distress, significant bleeding or abnormal coagulation studies, neurotoxicity such as cranial of palsy or descending paralysis including diaphragm. Second is the evidence of worsening local toxicity such as progressive soft tissue swelling. In severe toxicity, supportive care plays an important role in management. Blood transfusion, fresh frozen plasma or platelet transfusion can be given. Wound care is important. It should be clean with copious normal saline irrigation under pressure. However, leave intact blisters as natural bandages and deprive broken blisters or necrotic tissue. Prophylactic antibiotics can be given if there are signs of infection and also assess tetanus immunization status. Now in snake bite follow up closely for about 2 weeks because there is risk of delayed coagulopathy or thrombocytopenia in these patients. Serum sickness can also occur in those who have been given anti-snake venom. This occurs because of precipitation of antigen and immunoglobin G complexes in the skin, joints and kidney leading to arthralgia, urticaria and glomerulonephritis. Now those children who develop this late coagulopathy or thrombocytopenia should be given additional antivenom and the indications are as following. First is the clinically significant bleeding or platelet count less than 25,000 per cubic millimeter, INR more than 3 or activated partial thromboplastin time more than 50 seconds, fibrinogen less than 50 mg per deciliter, multi-component coagulopathy, worsening coagulopathy, high risk behavior for trauma or comorbid conditions such as systemic vasculitis, seizures or prior stroke. Thanks for watching this video. Please like, share and subscribe to my YouTube channel.